three, two, one. Today on The Process, we are having an incredibly special guest. His name is Philip Lim, and you may know him as the designer of 3-1 Philip Lim, but first and foremost, he is human, he is passionate, he is loyal, he is curious, and these days he is working on himself and pivoting his brand to finding a more sustainable balance. And today on The Process, we are talking to him about the process of sustaining ourselves in everything we do. So yeah. we're at um, Bangkok Groceries, and what's special about this little gem is it's specific to Thai ingredients. And what we're cooking today is my mom's Thai um, basil chicken. Which is the first recipe in your cookbook. First recipe in my cookbook. It kind of kicked off my uh, love affair with cooking. That's and, so incredible. Um, and this is really rare, and it's... Um, it rarely exists because a lot of people generalize what Asian food is, but within it, it's like thousands of yeah. different uh, uh, specialties. Yeah. And what's, what's special about this is I always come here for Thai ingredients in Southeast Asian. And today we're gonna pick up a Thai basil. And a Thai basil is different from a normal basil. It has a purple stem and right. it's very fragrant and not um, uh, lemony. What's your typical approach into like going into a grocery store and making sure you're getting everything but like remaining mindful while you're doing so? I try to um, just buy what I need. You know what I mean? I try to focus and try to make a list because without a list, it's, you can be all over the place. Cause you're like, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this. And then you're like, I'm going to throw everything away because I don't have time. Yes. So a list is a surefire bet to be successful in okay. mindfulness. Organization. Organization. Yeah, right? We're going to be so organized today. And we're going to be prepared to succeed. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. This is a special part of Chinatown too. In, it's almost like the outdoor living room of the community. Um, you have businesses, you have like funeral parlors, you have secret uh, uh, markets wow. where you get specialty foods. You also have like children playing. You have, uh, when we walk up there, elderly, you know, just congregating and having a social life. Is that their weekend thing? It's their weekend thing. It's their everyday thing. Every day? Yeah, every day. That's it's like, amazing. again, that's why I think I refer to like an uh, community living room. I love that. The outdoor living room outdoor situation. Living room, yeah. So, Tell me about your relationship with food when you were in California, mm -hmm. then when you moved to New York for originally mm -hmm. till now. Oh, it's so deep rooted because when I come from a family, um, I'm first generation and my mother and father very traditional and my, my mother, she always cooked homemade meals. Yeah. Three times, three meals a day and everything was, um, prepared in a way that, you know, was properly made. I don't, she, she was an incredible woman because she worked all day, but then she was also able to- As a to, seamstress. As a seamstress in a factory, a sewing factory and garment factory. And she would also be able to prepare all our meals. So growing up, of course, we take it for granted. Yeah. Um, all the beautiful fresh foods. And we still don't know how moms did it. We don't know how moms did it. It's really <laughs> like uh, head scratching, you yes. know what I mean? And yeah. we complain about having to multitask and our busy lives, but m my mother worked a full-time job at a factory and made all the meals, clothed all of us, six kids. Six? Six kids. What I'm number the youngest. are you? I'm the baby. Mm. I'm her baby. I'm the favorite. Still the baby and still the favorite. <laughs> Got still it. 100%. The baby, but I'm actually like the eldest now because I think I'm the only one that moved away. So when you're in close proximity, you take each other's relations for granted. So they don't see me a lot. So now they're like, oh, when he's here, let's just do whatever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> when we all arrived here uh, into the US, I was still, I was very young, about maybe like one and a half, maybe one. And so I couldn't go to school. I was always with her, you know? So we hung out. Um, we hung out getting to know this new country, basically. Wow. Um, and so while my siblings were away to school, she stayed at home in the early years. Um, just a regular mom, just a classic mom, you know, home cooking everything. 
When I told her I was going to be a fashion designer, it broke her heart. Because really? it's not fashion to her. It was just sewing. It was making clothes for pennies. You know, it's like, uh, it just work. It was, there's no such thing as fashion. She didn't know what fashion was. She put clothes together to put food on the table, you know? And so um, when I changed my uh, major from business to home economics, and I think it's called fashion and consumer sciences now, and there was like a, a major or a specialized in fashion merchandising. Mm -hmm. um, I told her that and it broke her heart and we didn't speak for about two years, two, three years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So we had a rocky relationship right before um, I moved to New York because it was just kind of, she said to me, I remember when I told her um, I'm going to be a fashion designer, I'm in the business clothing business. She goes, what is that? I'm like, oh, you know, you make clothes. She goes, but I make clothes to put food on the table for you. It's not okay. I want to do that, you know? You see how hard I work. You see that no one looks at me. You see that I'm like the bottom of the cast, you know? Um, and I'm like, no, mom, you know, I think what you do is really beautiful. And it's like, I love what you do and this and that. And um, prior to just coming to New York, we just weren't talking. And this was like a, a special, such a special relationship that we had growing up. And so when I moved to New York, um, it was just like, I remember being at the airport and I was like sitting in the airport, Long Beach, in like the Long Beach airport. And I was just bawling because I'm like, I haven't like made peace yet. You know what I mean? But I'm leaving to come to New York and I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know anybody here. I don't, I literally did not know anybody. here. I didn't want to come to New York. My life was in California. I'm a California boy. So, but then work took me here and I landed here. And I just went, I just blocked everything off and I built a company with my partner, my business partner, Wen, we just built a company. It was like zero to 60, zero to 100 in like three seconds. So it was like, that was in 2004 or five. What were you in that process of the zero to 100? What were the thoughts that you were having about your mom? I, I blocked everything out. Because you had to. I had to. That was the only way. And thank, thank goodness for work. It was so busy that it allowed me to do this. And everything that was important to me became secondary. And because I knew that I could not repair the relationship yet, and it was long distance now. Well, was it difficult because part of the reason that you fell in love with this field to begin with was because of her? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the respect that I have for, fash for clothes or fashion whatever we want to call it, is the make of it. Um, what it takes to make um, what you're wearing, you know, what it takes to even just like a sweatshirt to make a sweatshirt. People don't realize this and people treat this today as um, harmful or throwaway. You know, at the end of the day, clothing to me is like the ultimate neutralizer. Um, and it's, it's often in made, made by the most marginalized communities, you know what I mean? Which to them, it's really just a, an ability to clothe themselves, to um, put food on the table. So it teaches you the meaning of how to turn something so humble into something so meaningful. So that's my relationship with clothes. I'm sharing this 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 uh, publicly with everyone here, with yourself and everyone here. You're so honest. Yeah, so it's um, such a humble um, dish. And um, to me, it's very delicious and it means so much. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through it today. Beautiful. How would you say the um, health of your, like your personal health and your personal well being parallels with the health of your business? Mm, it, it has the ability to make or break. Really? Um, yeah. Um, if you think about it, um, if I'm feeling bad mm -hmm. or I'm not healthy, that's the energy I'll put into the space. That's the energy I'll put into the food. Mm. That's the negativity that I'll pr pass on to whoever is going to consume or uh, take it to the next level, you know? Yeah. So I think that I, I said this the other day, it's almost like um, you've got to be very cognizant of where you are and you know if you want things to be better it always has to start with yourself if you want change to happen 
you have to self-reflect and change what you're doing because it's like you can't continue the same and expect change because that's kind of an oxymoron. So we minced the garlic. We minced the garlic. Yeah. We've, I professionally <laughs> tore up the basil leaves. I've never seen torn basil leaves so beautiful. I put blood, sweat, and tears into this on camera. Intention. Intention. You put love into it, right? Yeah, I did. You know, sometimes we, we get to places in our lives and we're looking for answers and we're looking for remedies. Yeah. And we're just like going deeper and further and less natural when actually food is the place where we should always come back to ingredients, mm -hmm. where we take it back to the center, we take it back to the ground, we take it back to, um, this is like uh, the creator's, you know, creations. Yeah. And this is where healing happens. You know, not only from a, a, a physical space, but also from an emotional space, from a mental space, yeah. from a creative space. And I think that's why I love cooking so much because it's allowed me to find passion again in design. Really? Yeah, yeah. You think so? When do yeah. you think that that transition happened? Um, I began cooking about four years ago, three and a half years ago. And prior to that, I, I burned cup of noodles because I didn't realize you could not uh, microwave uh, metal, the lid, the foil. Wonderful. Cup of noodles. You burned it. Yeah. Um, it was trying to tell you something. Yeah. And I was like, okay, no thanks. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And then it was when I had that moment where I was missing my mother so much and I was kind of a little bit lost in the space where it's like, I've, what am I doing with creativity? It yeah. feels like just demand, demand, demand that food, the, the, the olfactory memories that I had uh, connected to my mom and wanting to just taste um, the food that she made again, even though we were so distant, yeah. that returned me to a space where, oh my, I should just treat everything creation as if it was my kitchen again, and I'm just making things and I'm experimenting and I'm tasting, and sometimes it'll be too salty, sometimes it'll be too spicy, sometimes it's like too dry, it goes back to clothes. Sometimes uh, it doesn't drape right, sometimes the, the the wool that you use is too heavy for this effortless feeling you know sometimes the shoe is too clunky it's all trial and error and it's all a process yeah and it's all um, non-linear and it all matters let's get cooking okay let's get cooking now we have things ready we have our uh, ingredients ready we have garlic there's minced chili. professionally um chopped up chili very professional um Expertly torn basil leaves, <laughs> <laughs> and then some uh, sliced Fresh onions. Ginger. Yeah, D uh, ginger. See, not I got onions. you. Yes, We're yes, team. yes. Okay, perfect. Basically, again, it's like I, I place it out in the order of ingredients. So okay. basically, um, how I start the base, into the meat, the sauces that will uh, layer the meat, and then we finish off at the last minute with the basil because it cooks really quick. So. so Turn on the stove. And I start with um, a medium heat level, just to quickly warm up the wok. And then I'll wait um, a couple seconds. So it kind of heats up the surface and then I'll put in the oil. So what, tell me, as you're putting the oil in, what is your favorite part in the process of cooking and why? My favorite part is the end. The end? If it comes Reach. out right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try. It could be my least favorite or my favorite, but I think it's going to be my favorite today. So basically, um, I just coat the wok slightly with oil because it coats all the surface. And what you do to test is like you, if it's hot, if it's ready, you just dip in, drop in some of the garlic and you see it moving around so it's ready. Yeah. Okay. They're like little fishies. Yeah, basically. So what we do is we start with the garlic. I use a lot of garlic for everything. And then what I do is I'll put in the chili pepper. From there, when I see a little browning, I'll, I'll add the ginger. And now you place the chicken in. So you didn't put any salt on the chicken. No, you no. didn't put anything. Nothing. Purposely. 
the sauces that we'll use. Will be the salt. Yes. Amazing. Okay. And then from there, I will add oyster sauce. And this is a Thai brand oyster sauce that we bought at the, the Thai mom. The Thai mom. We can trust her. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna add a little bit of sugar just to oh. caramelize it a little bit, and also we're gonna finish off with the fish sauce. Beautiful. Yeah. This is starting to look incredible. Yeah, right? And again, you can, um, you can smell it. I was just going to say the smell. I hope people Lower can the smell flame. the sound. Lower the flame because I'm going to put a lid on it and let it stew for a second. Okay. So what you want to do too is like check on it periodically and just um, stir it around. Just for flavor evenly distributes. And now towards the end, I turn back up the heat to high um, and you know different types of uh, meats will yield a different coloring too if there was skin on here like the wings it would brown more so with chicken breast it's really just the meat and not the skin so it right. stays more pale but it's gonna be delicious it um, looks and smells and I can already Feel it in my belly as well. <laughs> Ready? Yes, I'm starving. So this okay. is an official lunch is served. Lunch is served. Um, is there anything you say or do before you eat? Um, you can leave if you. Do you? Wait, there actually is something that <laughs> what I do say. You do? Okay, I mean we have like a little prayer that we say before we eat, so we say. Allahumma barik lana fi ma razaqtana wa qina adab al nar bismillah. So, um, what, whatever she said, I'm going with it. Basically, <laughs> like, bless us in the things that you have given us oh, and protect us, and in your name we eat. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes, that's it. Ready? That's it. Yes. This, I'm so excited. Oh, man. It's, it might be a little spicy, so just. Mm. Good? Mm -hmm. It's like home cooking. It's Simple home cooking. It's definitely in my belly. Yeah, it's in your belly. Not more than it, just the belly. <laughs> mm. This is so amazing. Mm. So as we are sustaining ourselves, tell me a little bit about your approach with human sustainability and more facets of your life, essentially. Mm. I think that it all comes down to finding ways that you can reset, whether through food, you know, um, like we spoke about like, for me, it's like fashion needs a spiritual reboot. Yeah. Um, how do we find the joy in it, in the, in the making, in the creating, in the delivering, in the um, uh, consuming, mm -hmm. you know, and I think um, like in my position, as a creator, the designer, it's really how I start and how I want to set the pace. Um, being an independent company, it's like, you know, we, we do or die by the dress, basically. If we put out a bad collection, then ugh, it gets risky. You know, it's not like we have um, investors or uh, deep pockets of money that we can just, okay, let's redo. Right. So it, it, um, by default, you know, we have to sustain Mm -hmm. We have to practice and be mindful of um, the resources we used. And in, today, you know, there's huge conversations about sustainability in terms of product, in terms of environment, which is so important because it is true. You know, um, everything going on around the world right now, it's not a coincidence. Yeah. It's, we're here. We're here. And if we open our eyes, then maybe we can do something about it to slow it down. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, then we'll be there. Yeah. And we don't want to be there. Um, you've, I mean, you've consistently used even your brand's platform to speak out about certain issues. Yeah. You talk a lot about specifically the tariffs mm -hmm. and your brand's yeah. struggle with that. When did you decide that you wanted to use your platform for more than fashion? Why was that so important to you? It's important because um, someone, my one of my dear, dear friends, um, uh, She's like a little sister to me, a young sister. And we started when I first came to New York, I brought her from California. And then um, when she read the article in WWD about us sustaining, um, refraining from having a fashion show 
and really taking a moment to pause or interlude to kind of reassess what our purpose. She said to me, it's incredible, Philip, because when we started, she started with me. She goes, it was about how beautiful the product was. It was about like, you know, um, fashion. Um, we would give, we would create and make the most beautiful things and try to um, uh, offer it at a very reasonable, accessible price. And we make ex democratized fashion, basically. Right. And she goes, what's interesting now is like, it turned from product to people. And I guess my values, you know what I mean? Like me coming into just um, doing this for a while and really shifting the purpose of not just about beautiful products, but how to think about people having a beautiful life, mm. you know? And I think that um, going back to speaking about just product and environment, you know, what I'm, what I'm, the conversation I'm trying to drive home is what about the human aspect of sustainability? Until artificial intelligence or um, technology takes and makes everything for us, you still have to sustain the people who make these sustainable products or right. care about the environment. If I'm not healthy and you're not healthy, why would, should we care if the environment's healthy? Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. it is really, you cannot separate it. You cannot speak about um, being sustainable or wanting to achieve a more sustainable balance, which is what we actually talk about. It's not sustainable because I don't believe you can be sustainable when you consume like this, but it's about figuring a ways to proceed with a more sustainable balance. Mm. You know, it's like what you take, you put back. Yeah. What, you, um, what you consume, you grow again. You know, so it's really attacking um, the process as a creator in many different ways, not just one direct way. Mm -hmm. Thinking about from the materials I use to the people I work with, to the company I keep, to the company I sustain, to the people I allow and make a mandate that they have time off to celebrate with their loved ones, mm -hmm. um, to just how I use my platform. And I don't know where it will all go, to be honest with you. But I know that I have to have the conviction and the courage to take these small steps when I can mm -hmm. and face these difficult decisions, you know? And I think that sustaining from the show for the first time in 14 years, 14 years was very difficult because um, for me as a designer and my team, the show is eight to 10 minutes of when the world is silent and we just, pursue our, we, we display the dream that we had or what we wanted to create and it's just silent. That's so incredible and actually brings me to something, I didn't tell you I was gonna do this, but I actually wanna read you something that you wrote. It's like I'm giving you a surprise. This, this is the book that I wrote. In your book, More Than Our Bellies, you write, it is my hope that you will enjoy this book, what this book brings you. The personal pilgrimage contained in each recipe in each photograph, each memory. This process has been an opening of my heart and a reminder to keep taking leaps of faith because here in the unknown is often where we find the next steps. Mm. There you go. You remind me. It's always when you're thinking of something, when you're feeling something, when you desire something, you should, it teaches me to pursue it mm -hmm. and to go after it because it's, there's a bigger message there's a bigger purpose to be had. And it's, it's amazing, I forgot I wrote that. And sometimes it's like, um, you gotta be careful how things manifest. Yeah. <laughs> be careful what you ask for and what you put down on paper. Philip, how is your heart today? Oh, I'm full. I'm full because um, this has been such a wonderful experience and uh, I'm happy and proud to to uh, share with you what kind of started it all for me and I feel like my mom's here um, and I can't wait for her to watch this you I know have to I let know her watch I this. will I will and um, I just feel honored to just be present with you here and us having this conversation and you know us enjoying our meal together what an honor I appreciate you so much I guess we can eat the food we made now yeah.